problem for cryptography. So one solution was Ralph's idea of um, we can communicate the secrets in the clear, but if you um, select one of them uh, and the bad guy can't know without decrypting them all which one you pick, then there's a work factor difference between us. Uh, but as we saw before, and you might want to check the maths on that yourself, just work out how much time it takes Ralph versus how much time it takes the adversary in the middle to crack it for different number of puzzles. What if you've got 10 puzzles? How long does it take Ralph? How long does it take the person in the middle? What if you've got 100 puzzles? What if you've got 1,000 puzzles? What if you've got a million puzzles? How many puzzles do you need if, I don't know, if we're communicating with someone, how much time can I put into finding the key up front? Could I put a minute into it? Probably not if I'm connecting to a web page. Probably want to find it in under a minute, I would say. I mean, we want that to be almost instantaneous. Um, and if I'm communicating with a spy, I might even be able to take 10 minutes or something, maybe. But suppose you've got a window there of somewhere between one second and, and 10 minutes. That's the amount of time that one person can decrypt a puzzle um, to set the whole thing up. Then how many puzzles do we need to send to keep an adversary away who's got much more compute power than us? You might want to do some calcs along those lines just to convince yourself that um, although it's clever, it's still not exactly feasible. It doesn't exactly solve our problem, but what a good idea. So with the promise of Ralph's solution in mind, we can think, ah, maybe this thing that seems really difficult, maybe there are um, almost magical solutions if only we looked hard enough. And a whole lot of people did. In fact, I think it was someone at GHCQ or the NSA or someone like that, some mathematician claims to have discovered this method long before the people in the clear discovered it. But, you know, they work for a secret government organization that doesn't share any information and doesn't increase um, knowledge around the world and doesn't help other mathematicians. So tough luck, you lost your credit. It doesn't matter if you invented it, you didn't share it, it doesn't count. So the first people that found it and shared it with everyone were Rivers, Shamir and Edelman, Ron Rivers, uh, you know, amazingly famous guy. Shamir, oh look, listen, a plane. That's such a rare sound. The value of my house has gone up quite a lot since the coronavirus came um, because there's large periods of times now without planes. There's a plane, I wonder where it's going. It's so exciting. Um, uh, Rivers, Shamir and Edelman discovered or invented this really clever idea. Here's how it goes. What they were thinking is, instead of it being like a safe, so I want to communicate with Clifford I go and, and I think of the cryptographic solution as being like a combination safe. So I go up to the combination safe and I unlock it. And then I put my letter to Clifford inside and that's unlocking it's, I mean, I unlock it, I put the letter inside, then I lock it. That's the equivalent of encrypting. And then Clifford walks up to the, uh, uh, the, the safe and he types the combination in, opens it up, takes the letter out. That's the same as decrypting. The shared secret here is the combination to the safe. So this is a lot, sort of a physical metaphor for encryption. And the danger is how do we, I get the combination to him? How do I look up for all, how many safes do I need? If I'm communicating with a million people and we all need to be able to communicate pairwise with each other, we need you know half a million times a million safes. That's a lot of safes, half a trillion safes. So that's not feasible. So, but maybe we can come up with another metaphor then. Maybe we don't have to stick with the safe idea. And those algorithms, by the way, are called, I think I mentioned last time, symmetric encryption algorithms, because the same key is used to unlock the safe by Cliff and me, Cliff and me. So, uh, if I know it, uh, the secret I needed to encrypt, then anyone who knows that same secret can decrypt. Anyone that opens the safe to put the message in can also open the safe to take the message out. So here's the other idea. What if everyone in the world has a letterbox that belongs to them? And what if it's locked with a key that only they have? That's the secret, the, secret, the shape of the key. Um, and what if there's a little slot on it and anyone can poke something in, but somehow physical magic, you can get things in through the slot, but you can't pull things back out through the slot. Somehow the world's best fish trap. So imagine that. Then if I wanted to send a secret to Clifford, all I've got to do is know where his postbox is and I could drop it in. And then he uses his key to take it out. I don't need the key. So even after I've dropped it in, I actually can't get it out again. Once I've encrypted a message, I myself can't decode it. So the power to encode, drop it in the letterbox, is different to the power to decode. And the nice thing about that now is key management, because how many keys do we need? Well, we need one per letterbox. You've got a million people. You don't need half a million times a million keys. You need, oh, by the way, that's an interesting piece of maths, isn't it? If, if I've got a million people, how come I need half a million times a million keys for everyone to have a different key for everyone they can communicate with? Um, and that's just a simple bit of maths, but let's just talk about it. for. It, it, that's a, an approximate number. Um, if all of those million people can communicate with 
um, the the rest of the million people, then every for every one of those people, for every person initiating the message, you need a million keys for everyone receiving the message. And then for the next person initiating the message, you need a million keys for all the people receiving the messages. And for the next person, you need another million. And for all the million people, you need a million keys. So that gives us a million times a million. Ah, but we've double counted because I need, I, I, if we were thinking, again, thinking me and Clifford, and I don't mean to pick on you, Clifford, I'm going to do this after this. Um, if it was me and Clifford, then when you get to me in the first list, then one of the million keys I need is one for Clifford. But then also when you get to Clifford in the first list, one of the million keys he needs is one for me. So we've counted that twice. So we divide it by two. So that's half of a million times a million. It's a big number. But with the letterbox ID, we just need a million letterboxes. So the number of keys we need scales linearly. And the number of keys any person needs to keep track of, instead of me needing to keep track of all the million keys that relate to all the million people I speak to. And let's be really clear, I could speak to more than a million people. There's more than a million inter addressable things on the internet. There's many, many more. There's an order of several Lots of orders of magnitude, more than a million things I can talk to on the internet. Um, so actually a million, million keys is not enough. Um, so yeah, I only need to keep track of one key rather than a million keys for my own personal use. So that's all now sounding really convenient. Um, so how would we come up with a cryptographic implementation of this letterbox ID? Well, Rivers, Shumir and Edelman came up with it and they named it after themselves and it's called RSA. And several other ones have come since. Um, but RSA is the simplest uh, and uh, it's quite beautiful. So that's the one we're gonna teach you. And if you've done any cryptography before or a million other courses, you probably, sometimes people have learned it four or five times in other courses because it's so beautiful that as soon as a lecturer has a spare 10 minutes, they often just teach RSA because it is quite beautiful and lovely. So sorry if you've learned it lots and lots of times. If you haven't learned it at all, I suggest you look it up a little bit and find out a bit more about how it works because it is beautiful. But here's the basic idea. And I'm gonna do this using high technology. Uh, it's a bit Mr. Squiggly. So um, here's the magic piece of algebra you need to know. You can't watch me writing, but I'll hold it up on a ring now. A to the B to the power of C. What's this? A to the B to the power of C. So let me put a concrete number in. What's two to the three to the power of two? That, two to the three to the power of two. Everyone try and work out what it is. Now hopefully you've worked out that two to the three is eight, because we did the thing inside the brackets first. And so the power of two means we square it, eight squared is 64. So the answer is 64. And then what's this? Three to the two. Oh no. Ah, yeah. <laughs> two to the two to the power of three. I'm going to swap the outside two ones around and I'm going to scribble all over it to make it more confusing. So you see, I swapped the uh, reversing two and the three around. So what's that? Well, two to the two is four. What's four to the power of three? Well, it's four times four times four. It's 16 times four, it's 64. Lo and behold, two to the three to the two is the same as two to the two to the three. Try saying that quickly and impress people. So it turns out in general, this is true, and you probably learned this in year 10. And, and you can see why if you actually draw the damn thing out. If you actually, um, maybe I should do that. Now maybe someone else wants to do that or I'll stick a picture of it up. But if you actually draw it down saying two to the three means two times two times two and squared means you multiply that by two times two times two again, and then you do the same thing, two, two squared is two times two, and then you do that three times, two times two times two times two, you'll end up with six lots of two times two. So yeah, Lisa, you're laughing in the background. It's, it's, I'm really jealous because we're doing multiplication and you're having fun. Um, so uh, in general, a to the b to the c equals a to the c to the b. That's it. These two things are the same. That's really the main thing you've got to know. Whoa, which finger am I using? Wrong one. This is the same as that. There we go. So here's the idea. Oh, I better hold it up a bit while I still talk. Um, the idea is this. If your message, think of it as a number. Uh, now, how can we think of a message as a number? Well, if you're a computer scientist, that's not hard to do because the message is just written in ASCII. It's a whole lot of bits. That's a massive number to the power of two. 
Um, that's so we we just think of computers express everything as numbers as a whole sequence of bits. So an enormous sentence is just a massively big number in binary. Um, we all know that. Uh, but to non-mathematicians, it might seem weird. But just believe us, you can assign to every message a number in the same way, naively, you could do it like this. You could say, oh, the letter A is worth one, and the letter B is worth two, and the letter C is worth three, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. So a number between one and 26 um, will give me one letter. And then what if I then write down another number between one and 26 and put it next to it? So the, for example, I'm actually going to do this because suddenly it's exciting. I've worked out a new encoding method that we should patent. The, uh, uh, the is like the 20th letter, T. Is it 20th? Uh, let's just say it is. Uh, T, H, E, uh, that's 20. And H is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, 8. And E is 5. So I could just write it down like this. Oh, are these numbers backwards or can you see them? Right way around? Thumbs up if they're good. Woohoo! Oh, everyone's thumbs are down. I wonder if my screen's upside down actually. Because you guys... good. Apparently, there's people stuck outside the meeting. What's that? Sorry, Clifford. Uh, check the chat. I'll check the chat. Yeah, Richard. Hi, it's Lisa. I'm going to um, just jump in and let people into the meeting. So hopefully it doesn't disrupt everyone that's already on there, but I'm going to try that now. Oh, yeah. I wonder how we let everyone in. Manage participants. Yeah, I'll, I'll update the settings. Should I'll we let them now. in? Let's take a vote. <laughs> what do you reckon? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Rowan, you man. My man. Except you're upside down. Uh, okay. Uh, we're going to have a race, Lisa, to see who can work it out. Uh, I can't work it out. Oh, yes, I can. How do I do this? Oh, I need all. Here we are. Everyone's in. Oh, and one more. Then, oh, and one more. Then, oh, and one more. Gee, people keep coming. Um, now, I have to say something that in a minute or two, I'm going to have to suddenly race away. So I want to give you a puzzle to do while I, I race away. I have to race away just for 10 minutes because I've got to do an ABC interview and this is the only time they can do it. So that's completely crazy. And if you watch the ABC at the same time, uh, that'll be very distracting. So uh, here's a puzzle for you. What I want you to do is I want you to look up some things. You can see them in the lecture notes if you want to go there. Um, but I want you to look up Two Card Monty. And there's a particular one I want you to see that I'll put a link to. I think it's called Two Card Monty Reveal. And I want you to play that magic trick, but then stop it um, before the guy reveals how he does it and see if you can work it out and keep rewinding and watching till you can do it. And then I want you to look up Three Card Monty, which is the find the lady, the famous thing that Terry Pratchett and everyone talks about. It's a famous trick. Um, look up Three Card Monty because that is so beautiful. The Three Card Monty scam. Yeah, yeah. And then last of all, if I'm away the whole time, is... Uh, oh, more people want to come in. Oh, this is very annoying. You should just let it run in automatically. I guess with, it's Australia, isn't it? Um, so, uh, uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah, the last one I want you to look up is this. The white van scam. Has anyone ever been scammed by the white van scam? Normally, there's at least one student that's been caught by it. So the white van, or sometimes it's called the white van speaker scam. So could you look up those three things? And for those who just joined, hello, welcome, welcome. Um, I'm just about to disappear for 10 minutes and you've got an exercise to do for 10 minutes, which is look up Two Card Monty Reveal. There's a couple of different Two Card Montys, but I've given a link to the good video that doesn't give it away too soon. Um, there's actually a couple of different tricks called it, but watch it, but don't, whatever you do, don't let it watch too, roll too far or the guy will explain how he does it. And I want you to work it out because I think with your brain, you can, it's a very simple trick to work out. There's nothing fancy going on. Just with logic, you can work that one out. Three card Monty, no one can work out. That's so awesome. So watch that and work out how it works and then look up the white band scan. Does everyone understand the homework? Yes? Yes, yes, yes. Or just sit there and look at pictures of cats and pretend you've done it because I can't tell, but I think you should do it. Okay, and I'll be back in, uh, I think the interview starts in uh, five minutes. They'll call me in one minute and it'll, they promise it'll only go for five minutes. So I'll be back probably when the big hand's on the seven, at the very latest when the big hand's on the eight. Okay, so I'll see you soon, guys.
is anybody talking yet or am I just okay so there are people that are connected to voice no worries <laughs> we're all just waiting for Richard to get back of course I can take over the lecture Chris uh, I don't know the content for this week sadly <laughs> that's actually why I'm here <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Chris, just improv. Yeah. No, 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 no improv. I'm going. I thought you had a question there. No. My question is how well can you do this lecture improv? Please don't bait him. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, question. I missed all of that. My headset DC. The real question is, what rank are you on Rocket League? Oh, here we go. <laughs> so is this entire lecture a meme? It's an April Fool joke. Richard is Aren't all of them with ABC. Oh, is he actually pranking us right now? <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't put it past Richard. He's probably having dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real joke. Yeah, so if you scroll up through the chat, there is a task for you to do. Go watch the Two Card Monty video. Um, but yeah, we're just memeing right now. I can't scroll up because I only got let in quite recently. Yeah, same. Can you repost the link? I googled two card Monty, but then all of them were like tutorial videos where it just starts with showing you how the trick is done without actually doing the trick. <laughs> how to defeat the purpose of the... I think Thank it's you. the first one. It's like the first few seconds. is in One of them is Rick right? Astley. I'm sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, two of the links are the same, so it's either one of them or two of them. Disappointed it's not all. So am I. One or two people have ruined it for everyone. Yeah, that's a good idea, Shaman. Somebody got me in their job apps last year. Actually, a lot of people got me in their job apps last year. They put evidence as the Rick Roll video. It just ruined it for everyone. Oh, no. I'm pretty sure you mentioned that during a previous shoot, but... Yeah, I'm shouting it out now, so if anyone wants to get any computers <laughs> that aren't listening, please do. <laughs> I'm just going to make every link a Rick Roll video. Well, you'll get zero for your job app then, because I do need some evidence. Oh, I'll make it redirect multiple tabs. <laughs> okay. Is that a thing you can do with HTML? You can do it with JavaScript. Ew. Don't swear in my presence, please. <laughs> JavaScript is the language of the world. Thank you, web browsers. Which programming language do you back then, Chris? Uh, if you're not writing in assembly, you're not a real programmer. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you mean you don't bootstrap your own computer? No, I'm, I back the one that is back out now while you still can. <laughs> don't you know, if you use Rust, then you're 100% safe. Yeah, thanks, Benny. <laughs> Except for programmer errors. <laughs> So where's Mark Son to come and plug like Vue.js or something? I'll see if I can get him on. I'm pretty no, sure. no, 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 no. That's not my use... intention. That was not what I meant. <laughs> if you don't use Vue and Firebase, you are so fundamentally wrong. You are just objectively incorrect. <laughs> hey, Lisa, is there a cap to how many people can join a Zoom meeting? Look, the tutors, Richard and the tutors, have the pro edition that we've been able to upgrade through UNSW. So if you just have the free, I th yes, there is a cap, I think it's 
right up to 300, but the free version, you're also limited to 40 minutes. Okay, yeah. I'm just making sure that like everyone can actually join the lectures. I wasn't sure. If... Oh, yeah, yeah. No, we've definitely got enough room. Okay. There was just... Um, Lachlan and I were discussing that we've got to ban Richard from setting up his own link because something was ticked that meant everyone had to sit in a waiting room before joining. So we'll make sure that's off in future. Or Richard doesn't do it. <laughs> Very much like Richard. Yes, please. Um, so I'm just having a look at Zoom now. Zoom Pro is 100 participants. Zoom Business is 300 participants. So hopefully it's a business plan. Because yeah, I am seeing that 99 participants and it's a very um, worrying number. But in past lectures, we have gone past 100. There's been like 115. Yes, but today but, I know, had to wait for so long to get in. I think somebody has to approve that. Yeah, we'll definitely fix that for next time that we won't have that waiting. That, that was a mistake for tonight. Uh, Shrey, very nice XKCD. I haven't actually seen that one before. Is now the time to plug the lecture for the extended lecture? Definitely, please. Go for right it. Um, just for those of you who are in extended or want to come for the live demonstration, I'm doing the wireless hacking tomorrow at uh, during my tutorial, so it'll be at 6 o'clock. So six until six thirty ish will be me showing off how to do how to break into WPA two networks and wireless enterprise networks. Um, so if you want to come down, and you've got any questions and that sort of thing, please just join the tutor meeting uh, in the open learning pages where all the tutorials are posted. Um, it will be recorded for those of you who do want to see it later or don't have the time or whatever else. But the more the merrier. I'd like a lot of people there so that if there are any questions, somebody's there to ask it. Richard's on the ABC right now. Do, can somebody pull up the ABC live stream? Is there a, oh, thank you. Hold on, Sarah. I'm surprised it's Richard. live. Chance Lisa could, Lisa could um, screen share the live stream. Uh, I tried to screen share, but it's not working. I'm locked out of it. Only the host can screen share. Try sharing the screen again, see if it works now. Okay. Who's on it? Jess. We. <laughs> nice. Sorry, guys. The man, the myth, the legend. While we're killing time, does anyone have any admin related questions that I can help out with? Is our something awesome during week eight or week nine? Uh, something awesome's are due in week nine. We will have to put out a communication about that. That's a good question. 
Okay, awesome. Thanks. Is that we the will. demonstration that's due? Yes. And so you're tuned in week nine. How's that going to happen? Is it just going to be over Zoom? Uh, yeah, it'll be over Zoom in your tube Zoom call. Cool. Cool. Uh, looking at Trey's question, Trey's questions in the chat. Uh, is there extended tonight? Uh, no, there's no live extended lecture tonight. Uh, Chris, back me up on this. It's your lecture. You'll be releasing a recording of the lecture. Yeah, so if you want to join in and, and see the live lecture, it's going to be the uh, the wireless hacking. So that'll be on at 6 o'clock tomorrow night uh, during my tutorial session. So if you go to the extended drop-down for open learning, where all the tutorial links for Zoom are posted, just join that. Um, it will be recorded after that, and it will be put up by the Thursday night or Friday morning for you guys to watch if you can't make it. Hey, Chris. Yeah. If I mail you a suspicious looking USB, can you plug it into your laptop for my something awesome? What's the politest way to say no? Exactly. Uh, re re with regrets. Um, yeah, no, I, I do not have a burner laptop lying around that I can just go plugging USBs into, especially ones that I know are malicious from you. Oh, uh, trust me, this thing looks menacing. <laughs> Uh, Shrey, just on your second question, there will be weekly activities. They will be released either Wednesday or Thursday. I'm not sure yet. Um, they will be stuff that you can do from home relatively easily. Chris, do you want to add anything more on that? or No, I haven't done them yet. I'm sorry. Well, good. We will get them done in the next 24 hours. Yep, no, oh, well done asking about the dropout market criteria. Keep asking. No, we haven't put it out. We need to get that out this week. We are terrible, and I'm so, so sorry. And hopefully Richard will join in, and we can all ask him together. If well, we're really he just signed off, so... I think Richard's going back. on now. Don't forget to get, all give him a clap. Hey! Hey, hey Richard. Thanks for the screen hey share. Let, well let, let me just get this working. Sorry, I was just on hold and then something went wrong at the ABC and oh, they just left me waiting there, which is fine. They're doing good work. We watched the whole thing. Let me just check. This is actually working. Why can't I hear anyone? Hello? Uh, or me. Can you hear me? We can we hear you, Richard. Ah, okay. <laughs> Give me one more second, guy. Wait, did he? Uh, that looks like it's working, and that looks like it's working, but this isn't working. Are you there? Nobody, yeah, nobody's I can talking. Hear you on the speakers. Oh, Who knows man. what's going on? Change your output Think, device. Yeah, I did change the output device. The problem is um, there are several several different places where you can change the output device. Um, I mean, Richard, did you just hear that? Yeah, I can hear you. We can hear you. Yeah. So, but either overall settings or in the Zoom settings. Does anyone know which oh, one are the rules? Right. Is that you, Chris? That is me. How are you? Not bad. I've already plugged my lecture for tomorrow, so I don't need to do that again. Ah, fantastic. Yeah, everyone should definitely see it. Definitely see it. Did you also uh, tell everyone about your great Amway deal? Richard? My what, sorry? Yeah, um, yeah sorry, someone said something. Uh, yeah. Richard, if you click the arrow next to mute, on the microphone, go to audio settings. You should be able to change your- Oh, you legend. Device. Who's saying this? Very nice, Mickey. Mickey, Mickey thank you. Oh, I should have recognized your voice. Hello. We can't, we can't hear you. Hear you. Hello. Now we can't hear you. <laughs> no, I can't hear you. <laughs> Make sure you're not muted. Um, on that um, next to the arrow next to the mute icon should also have uh, microphone settings and then uh, speaker settings as well, where you can select the input and your output. No. Nope. <laughs> 
has a mute switch. I oh, uh, <laughs> the hardware mute well switch. Done. Well found. <laughs> okay. So I uh, hope while I was away, uh, did everyone get to look at Two Cow Monty? We did. What did, did you? Did anyone work it out? Don't give it away for those that haven't worked it out. But who managed to work it out? Uh, Wait, I did. You did? Yeah. And was that you? Yeah. Yeah, that was me. Wow, that's really impressive. I watched it like about 50 times before I eventually got it. I damn well wasn't going to watch the end, but it um, sounds like you got it. 50 times took quite a long time. Um, that's really impressive. So everyone do try and get it. Uh, three Card Monty, are you amazed by that? Three Card Monty for me is the ultimate scam. It's really beautiful. It's perfect misdirection because what you think the trick is isn't even the trick. And the whole time you're trying to work out how the trick works, it's a different trick. It's a trick inside a trick. It's very, 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 very clever. And last of all, the white um, van scam. Uh, has anyone heard of or encountered that before? The white van speaker scam. So a couple of years ago, oh, it would have been a decade ago now, I did it with, uh, I was talking about it. And one student said, oh man, that just happened to me last week or something. So there's someone in Australia doing the white van speaker scam. So it has been around for a long time. Um, I haven't Googled this year to see if it's still active, but I bet someone somewhere is still doing it. So beautiful scam. Um, so if you know about those three scams, that would make me very happy. All right, let's get back to the lecture notes. I'll just go to share screen. And That was a great interview, by the way. Oh, you heard the interview at the same time as I was giving it? Yeah. Yeah, we watched the interview. We all watched How did you manage to watch it? But it ABC live. IV live stream. <laughs> Guys, are so good. Um, yeah, uh, what do you reckon? Did I say anything stupid? I always, I always say something stupid and afterwards I kick myself, but I was so flustered thinking of you guys sitting there waiting, I can't even notice the stupid ones. I really like the two generation thing. I hadn't heard that before, but it makes sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. It's spot on, Chris. You've somehow got to work out what the blockers are whenever you're doing something and then think of lateral ways of solving it. And all, this is a Sun Tzu thing. One way of solving it is working out elaborate ways of not annoying your parents. But a better way of solving it is, well, don't have you do it then. <laughs> so, yeah, just just chain, reframe the whole game. It's a bit like three card Monty. All right, here we are. I'm going through the um, things. Oh, sorry. I'll tell Zoom to mirror my screen so you can see what I'm doing. Uh, and that presumably, Zoom is so good. Hold on. Things make sense. Desktop, 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 desktop. Chrome. Here we go. Sharing Chrome. Let me know if you can see it. Hope you can. Is that all good? Yeah, I can see it. Yep. All right, great. Um, so let's go now, guys. And I've lost you. I've lost pictures of you. Oh, well, okay. Don't worry. I won't be too ambitious. Um, so I'm just going to useful links, lecture notes, uh, slide. Here we go. All right. Asymmetric encryption. So I've talked about the general idea of it, and I mentioned the whole thing about um, A to the power of B to the power of C is the same as A to the power of C to the power of B. And they're both equal to a to the power of, and here's where it's bad to be doing it by words. I really need to get someone to take a photo of me saying this and send it to you. It's the same as A to the, in brackets, B times C. And because now you can imagine it, B times C is the same as B times A. So you can see why the two things are the same. So anyway, here's the idea. I am going to have to go back to a picture of me. Can you see me at the same time as this, or can you only see the screen? Uh, yeah, we can see, see you in the corner. Oh, can you? Oh, good. All right. I'm going to hold the thing up again. Is that clear enough? Can you see that? There's a button top right to swap between the screen share and the speaker, guys. Is that Maybe you can yeah. just click on the person. Remote control, is that it? Uh, pause recording. Also, if you have two monitors, there's a dual screen mode, which brings up both side by side. Oh, yeah, I had that working before. Thanks, um, whoever's saying that. Oh. Uh, working before, and I had set up an extra monitor, so I would do that. But somehow it drops out of dual screen mode sometimes. Uh, how do I keep put it back? I think I noticed if I went to preferences and turned it off and on again, and then it worked all of a sudden. Let me try that artificial thing. Here we are. Uh, do, 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 do. Where is it? Does anyone remember where that setting is? It tells it to you. Oh, here we are, dual monitors. Turn it off, turn it on. Now it's appeared again. Thank you. I've got 
you there. Ah, I can see you and I can see what I'm holding up. All right, good. Okay, so A times B times C. I just wanted to um, just quickly explain the important thing, which is we're thinking of a message as a number. For example, the word the here, you could think of it as the number Remember, we, we wrote the 20 for the T and the 0 for 08 for the H and the 05 for the E. So that's just a syntactic change or replacement. But you can see now you could think of it as the number 20, what, uh, 200,805. 200,805 in rigid encoding is the word the. So obviously it's not a very efficient encoding. There's a whole lot of codes that don't correspond to numbers or letters or anything. But but you can see you could turn any string, any sentence, any message into a number this way. So once we've got a number, then we can do maths on the number. Now, here's the clever idea. All the crypto we've seen so far involves taking a message and then jumbling it, permuting it, and transposing it. I mean, that's jumbling, sorry, it's not and. Uh, and also substituting, so changing things. So when I see this, I swap it with that. When I see this, I swap it with that. When I see this, you swap, turn into that. So I turn A into Z and B into Y, or I turn this pair of letters into that pair of letters or whatever. So substitutions, transpositions, and then just complicated ways of doing that are really all the traditional ciphers we've seen. But there's this new class of ciphers that we're looking at now, the asymmetric ones, and they use a different idea, which is rather than getting chaos by just doing lots of jumbling complicated things, let's get chaos from the land of mathematics because some things in maths are just chaotic, like the distribution of the primes, the digits of pi, there's, um, you know, the operation of the Mandelbrot set. There's all this beautiful structure in mathematics that seems to have randomness in it to the extent that we don't understand it. So it looks like randomness to us. That's sort of the definition of randomness, I guess. So if we can use the randomness and the confusion that's in maths to do our enciphering, then we can actually possibly even start saying more assertive things like how hard it is to crack something. If, if for example, here's a clever thing. If you could somehow come up with a cipher that's based on a famous problem in maths that people have been trying to solve for a long time. And if you could set it up in such a way that this cracking a message, decoding a message without the key is equivalent to solving this really hard problem in maths, then you've got some confidence that the thing can't be cracked because mathematicians have been trying to crack this uh, uh, hard problem for a long time and they haven't been able to. What's the chance of some kid or a computer science, you know, um, a busy, stressed, you know, cyber hacker or something like that, being able to beat all the top mathematicians in the world that really do nothing, it's very sad, but sit down. Never say never. Yeah, yeah, what's that? Never say never. Never say never, of course, that's right. In the land of uh, security, uh, it's only a matter of time. All we buy ourselves is time. But if we tie it... Is that, is that the theory behind elliptical curve cryptography? Exactly, exactly right. Yep, that's right. Um, uh, it's the theory behind all of the... Um, essentially, all the asymmetric encryption algorithms rely on this same thing, that uh, to solve it, you need to solve a hard problem. Now... No one's fully ever managed to get it set up so they can prove that the only way of solving it is solving a hard problem. So maybe it's possible to solve it, to crack the code, without solving the hard mathematical problem. We've unfortunately in the other way that if you can solve the hard mathematical problem, you can crack it. But we haven't managed to prove that if you can crack it, you can solve the hard mathematical problem. And if we can go the other way, then we'd have assurance about how hard it was. Yeah, someone was asking. Um, regarding one-time pads, if you encrypted a message with a one-time pad and you changed a single character and encrypted a different message, is that sufficiently secure or would that be um, susceptible? It, to oh, I know. So I should be really clear here. I haven't told anyone about one-time pads except occasionally mentioning how awesome they are and I can't wait till we teach you. Um, and maybe we should do that right now. Is that a good thing to do, Mickey, and then answer your question? Uh, that's fine with me. There was just a, there was an activity on one-time pads a couple of weeks ago, and I was just wondering how much difference is oh, okay. made. So everyone knows one thing that's already. Okay. Yeah. So the um, just for those that haven't yet done all the activities, let me give you a summary. The uh, a one-time pad is a substitution cipher, so it's where you change this letter into that. But the key is the same size as the message. There's as much information in the key as there is in the message. And now if you've got that really nice property, then that. Gives you all sorts. It, it allows you to establish all sorts, all sorts of other properties hold. 
which require that property. Having that property isn't enough, but that property is essential to have to get these other nice properties. And the other nice properties essentially relate to it being uncrackable. So how a one-time pad works is this letter of your message and you, um, you add a random number between one and 26 to it, say three, you move three on in the letters. And then the next letter, you add a random number, maybe it's 20, so you move 20 on in the letters. And if you get to Z, just wrap back around to A and keep going. And for every letter in the message, you have a different, I mean, you just generate random numbers for each, for each one. And then as long as the person at the other end doesn't know, and you need as many random numbers, obviously, as you have letters in the message. So the key, the random numbers is as long as the message. As long as the other person at the other end knows that sequence of random numbers, they can decode the message. But the nice thing about it is no one else can because that message looks exactly, could plausibly decode to any other message of the same length with just a different key. Um, there's, there's no redundancy in it at all. There's no compression going on here at all. So you can't suddenly go, well, whoo, I've cracked it, like you can with Vignette. And when you've cracked it, you know you've cracked it because the chance that some other key would let you crack and get every get meaningful English words is almost zero. I mean, so close to zero, it's nothing. But with a one-time pad, yeah, any message of any length can be decoded to any other message of the same length. So um, it's a very beautiful strategy and spies use it a lot. But the problem is they have to carry around with them a pad with all the random numbers written on it. And back at the factory, at the headquarters, the control headquarters, um, they make two copies of every pad. And then the people sending it go through the pad, getting the random numbers, and the people receiving it go through their copy of the pad, getting the random numbers. They cross them out as they go, and you better make sure you don't move out of sync. And, and then when you finish using the numbers, you eat the piece of paper or burn it or something like that. Um, and that is an uncrackable method. The problem is, you need a lot of random numbers to do it. You've got a big key problem here. So when your spies go overseas, they take a big book of random numbers with them. Um, I've often thought YouTube videos would be a great way of transmitting blocks of random numbers, by the way, because you know a good video or something that's really well compressed does look like a whole lot of random bits and it would be accessible from the other side of the world. So the spy could just log in and look at the same thing you're looking at and you'd get gigabytes of random bits. As long as that you were seeing exactly the same thing, that might be a way of distributing keys, code books. But anyway, the problem with one-time pads is if you don't use them one time, if, if you use that same pad again, even just using it twice, it's a bit like reassembling um, shredded paper and thanks for the people that put the Brooklyn Nine-Nine uh, thing up. That was very funny um, about paper shredding. But yeah, if you have, if you reuse the one time pad on two different messages then now there's enough in, there's enough uh, non-randomness in there that code breakers can start to break it and there are famous examples of that happening during the war i think it was the germans or maybe it was the russians ran out of code books and started reusing them uh using reusing books that already issued because generating random numbers is a bit hard and um and how they do it is they generate them and type them on a typewriter with a sheet of carbon paper so that you can make the two books um so why not put four sheets in and you can make twice as you can make books twice as fast making duplicate books. But unfortunately that was a terrible weakness. And a lot of those messages have now been cracked after the war. In fact, there's an ongoing project to crack a lot of the messages sent in the war with one time pads where we know they use duplicates. Um, so anyway, Mickey, your question was what? My question was if you encrypt a message with a key and you change one character in that key, is that sufficiently different to encrypt another message? No, you need to change the whole key. You need to change the whole key. But if we're talking pure randomness, there is a chance that would be another key. Oh yeah, but the chance is very low. So okay. if I knew you'd done that, if I didn't know you'd done that, uh, yeah, but I'd be, I'd be, that's what I'd be looking for. I'd be looking for similar keys. That's the only thing I've got available, so I'd be trying it, so you're just unlucky. Um, yeah, yeah, two random ones picked. The chance of the numbers coinciding is very, very low. If you write the random numbers out in binary, um, then for any pair of corresponding bits, there's only a 50, 50, there's a 50 50 chance they'll match and a 50 50 chance they'll be different. So you'll get lots of matching bits. On average, half of them will match and half of them will be different. But um, if they're clustered in some way, then the crypto analyst is going to make use of them. Cool. Um, okay. So, uh, Anyway, that whole diversion, which was, I hope, interesting to you, was just saying one way of encoding is just doing complicated stuff and say, oh, man, that's so complicated. No one could ever put that back together. Oh, so he, he's an example of that. Um, this is an example from Bruce Schneier, who I really love. So. And he wrote that book, Applied Cryptography, that I think I keep telling everyone to look at. I wonder if I have a copy here. I'll hold it up to you excitedly. No, I don't. Um, is that in? But um, here's, here's one way of sending a message. You write the message on the back of a plate. You get a, like a porcelain plate, a big ceramic plate. You write the message with a waterproof marker like this on the back of the plate. 
you put the plate in a sack and then you smash it with a hammer into lots of tiny little pieces. Now, it's almost impossible if the bad guys intercept the sack for them to reassemble the plate out of the pitches. So it's essentially uncrackable. Oh, that's a bit of a pun, actually, isn't it? It's essentially, oh, I touched my face. Ah. Um, it's essentially uncrackable. But what's the problem with that sci-fi? Rowan, what do you reckon? It's uncrackable, but also very difficult to reverse. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I discovered a trick, by the way. I don't know if it works for you guys. If you hold the space bar down, you're temporarily unmuted. Um, yeah, that's right. It's hard for a bad guy to crack the code, but it's also hard for the intended recipient to, to read the message, to decode it. So what we always want in um, uh, is we want to have something they sometimes call a trapdoor. We want to have some way of, yeah, it's really hard to decode, except if you know something, there's a trapdoor that lets you decode it fast. And then you make sure that the recipient knows the trapdoor. So... Way number one is jumbling things. Way number two is using the randomness in maths and asymmetric cryptography algorithms use maths. Um, and that is really beautiful. So the famous one, RSA, you just uses the fact that A to the power of B, or uses a couple of other facts too. A to the power of B to the power of C is the same as A to the power of C to the power of B. So again, holding it up just to make it really clear, if my message is A, the number A is a message, you see? Like it's like this number, oh, I've got the left and right, it's not working. There, it's like this number here. So write your message, turn it into a number, and then raise it to some power. Oh, where's my finger going? Here, there. That's encoding the message. And then to decode it, raise that, which is A to the C, and turn it again, raise that to the B, and then you go back to the beginning. Oh, sorry. That's what you want to happen. <laughs> that's how RSA works. It's not clear that that will happen yet, but that's what you want to happen. Now, the problem if you raise one number to another number is it gets much, much bigger. And in terms of uh, the number of digits, uh, the number of digits increases. So if you square something, the number of digits in the output is probably twice as big as the number of digits in the input. It's no use having a cipher that your cipher text are massively bigger than your plain text. But in maths, we can do this thing called modding. And modding means you, um, you divide by something and you only look at the remainder. So let me do some examples of mods. Um, suppose we're going to take mod 10. So that means divide by 10 and look at the remainder. What's mod, what's mod 10 of 17? Seven. Seven. What's mod 10 of 52? Two. Two. What's mod 10 of 9,826,000? Six. Six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just strips the last digit off. That, so the remainder after you divide it is the last digit. Um, now, so mod 10 is really easy to do because the way we, for us, because the way we write numbers down in base 10, uh, the remainder is actually the last digit. Uh, but if we were modding by 13, it'd be more complex. So what's 15 modded by 13? Two. Two. Yeah, yeah. 15 is two more than a multiple of 13, a multiple of 13 being 13. What about 30 mod 13? Four. Four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because 26, which is two times 13, is four less. It's four more than that. So when you divide by 13, you've got a bit left over. How I try and explain that to my children when I explained RSA to them when they were, um, when they were like three and four, was uh, I say, okay, we've got a bag of lollies we're going to distribute between the three of you guys. We've got 10 lollies. How many are left? Man, they could work that out straight away. There's one left. So 10 mod three is one. I'd say, ah, oh, okay. What if we had a party and like you had 10, 12 people at your party and we had 100 lollies? Is that enough or is there going to be some left? They got 12, 12, 12, 12, 12. And they try and work it out. And I can't, I should be able to work it out. What is it? 12, we've got 60. So how much? That would be 40, 36. So it's four. Four. It must be 96, must be a multiple of 12. So there's four left. And they work that out pretty fast. Because if you think of lollies and sharing and the unfairness of having leftovers, then human intuition jumps in. Super good. So that's what modding is. Modding is you divide by something and you look at the remainder. And the nice thing about it is if I said to you, just pick a, a random number. Uh, well, I did before. I picked 100. I said 100 mod 12. What is it? Well, essentially, the output's sort of random. I mean, if it's the last digit, you can predict what it is. But if I just picked a random number and said, I don't know, mod 17, what's 526 mod 17? I've got no idea. It could be any number between 0 and 16 with sort of equal likelihood. So it sort of distributes it around quite nicely. So that's what we do with our codes. We raise it 
We take our base message, our number, we raise it to a power, we get a really big power, and then we mod it by something and we look at the remainder only and that's a smaller thing. Uh, and that keeps the message back to the, and we make it the same size as the original message. Okay, so RSA is really clever and how RSA works is you work out a pair of keys, which are each numbers, and you work them out so that any message raised to the first number and modded by something, n say, some number that you tell everyone, if you then raise it to the second power, you get the original message back. That's very clever. That's very clever. So I send you a message by modding it by one of the numbers and you decode it by modding it with the other number, uh, raising it to the power of the other number and then modding it. So here's how it works in practice. One person works out the pair of numbers using some special secrets, the trapdoor thing. One person works out the pair of numbers. They tell everyone one of the numbers, but they don't tell anyone the other number. And you can never work out the other number. Or well, no one's worked out a fast way of working out the other number from one number. You had to generate them both together. If I just give you one of them, I am, you know, the other one's a mystery to me. So everyone in the world knows one of them and they use that to encrypt a message and send it to you. And that's like putting it in the letterbox. And then I know the other number, that's like having the key to the letterbox, I can decrypt it. So the number I tell everyone, I call my public key. And the number I keep to myself, I call my private key. I never tell anyone in the world my private key. I tell everyone in the world my public key. Anyone who wants can send me a message encrypting it with the public key. They can't decrypt it again once they've done it. No one can decrypt it except me because I'm the only person that knows the private key. And that is the idea of asymmetric encryption. The key for encrypting is different to the key for decrypting. And have you heard of the phrase public key before and private key? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was a long do way. Key, do the keys work in both directions? Yes, the keys do. That's Mickey. I recognize your voice. Um, because A to the B to the C, same as A to the C to the B. So if so you encrypt with the decrypt, from, you can decrypt with the encrypt key. From what I've seen, the private key is always significantly longer than the private key. Ah. Sorry, the public key. So, uh, so the pair of keys are generated up front and you can pick which pair you get or you can pick one of them and then the other one's determined. And normally you make one of them quite fast to do and the other one slow to do. And I can't remember which is the fast one. I think normally the public key is the fast one. Is that your observation? If it's shorter key, I would assume that's faster. Yeah, yeah shorter key is faster. Basically... Um, Raising something to a power, because you're raising it to the power of the key. If you raise it to a smaller number, it's faster. Um, now, the, there is a fast way of raising things to a power. Um, so yes. Do uh, you know that anyway? You know fast exponentiation? Yes. It's very beautiful, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, basically, it's just the number of ones in the binary representation. It doesn't have to be short. Uh, so 17, for example, so not a bad example of a key, it's probably got cryptographic weaknesses that I don't know about, it's way too small, but um, but 17 is 16 plus one, so it's only got two bits in its representation, so it turns out that's quite fast. But that's just for pragmatics. The, the, the theory works for... So is it possible to derive the public key easier from the private key than it is the other way around? No, they're each as easy to derive from the other as they are from the other. That's okay, right. so you can release either key? You could release either one, that's right. You generate this pair, you call arbitrarily, you call one of them the public and one the private. That's right. So hypothetically, if the public key is faster to compute, you could release the private key, keeping the public key secret, yeah. and then you move the workload to the client. Yeah, yeah, you're sounding a bit like um, some multinational corporations, I know. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, you just gotta work out how you're gonna do it. Yeah, that's right, whatever's the optimal solution. That's right, absolutely. So, oh, people are scribbling all over it. Oh, you guys are legends, that's fantastic. But I'm not gonna talk about this anymore. I think I've talked enough about public key cryptography now that you get the idea. Is that right? Does everyone get the idea? Yes, not if, you're, you're sort of not quite, Ian. So, um, what if we, I might give you some simple examples you can fool around with. What do you think of that? Just so you can practice it a little Richard, bit. Richard, is what I wrote on your screen correct? X to the N mod Z equals B. B to the M mod Z. Is that what you were trying to describe? I got myself confused, so I'm just trying to figure out if I'm thinking so, correctly. Yeah, M and... Where it's like N and M are the public and private keys. That's right. And B is the cipher text and X is the plain text. And, and is it the same Z? Uh, and it's the same Z. That's right. Okay. 
fantastic. Thank you. Um, and that's because of some problems of abstract algebra, the, the properties that we don't, I don't think in a normal maths, in the maths you guys do, I don't know, you might do it in discrete. You don't, do you work with um, mods? We do mod, yeah. I think it was discrete. We did it, we did it in the form of um, finding uh, lowest common denominators but we don't go as far as RSA. Oh, in, in Math 3411, you learn full RSA algorithm. Ah, oh, is it awesome? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's fun. It's cool, isn't it? It's really cool. That's with Thomas Britz. Ah, uh, he's very good. He's yeah. so that's, good. That's the security course, isn't it? Information and ciphers? Yeah, information codes. Yeah, that's it. Everyone should do that course. That is a beautiful course. Yeah, yeah. And then don't stop with that course. Keep going. I mean, the whole field is so interesting. Uh, yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, it's basically the group properties of mods are. are uh, and it's a nice way of demonstrating things. So you might have come across it in, in that book. But um, but yeah, exactly what you've written here. Who was it that wrote it? Because my screen's sort of blocking it. Who is that? Uh, Oliver. Yeah, what Oliver wrote. Everyone, I wish I'd written that. Everyone, take a screenshot of that, Oliver. Except Oliver, actually, we use different letters. I should tell you the standard letters everyone uses just for sort of communication. So the plain text or the message we often call M. So I'd replace the X with an M. And the, in, oh gee, we're gonna permute all the letters you can use. It's gonna be so confusing. Um, because the, uh, the, let's call the private and public keys A and B. So M to the A mod, and we always mod it by something called N, because N is like the size of the, of the group, yeah. Uh, and let's say it's equal C, because C can be a ciphertext. And then let's do C to the B, the ciphertext to the B, mod N again. Oh, this is so good, thank you. Is this Oliver doing it again? Let's have a look. Yeah, you are, you legend man. Uh, and uh, that equals the original message back, which is M, perfect. It's unbelievable, but true. I'll give you some actual examples to do and you can convince yourself it works. It's very, very beautiful. And maybe I'll teach you a bit of the maths behind it so I can, you can work out how to actually crack it. Um, because you can crack small, uh, it, when, when, when the numbers are small enough, you can actually crack it. Um, it's only when the numbers get big that we don't have any uh, efficient ways of cracking it. So maybe I'll teach you enough that you can do that. Okay, but anyway, let's go back to um, the screen. That's so good. Using what am I seeing here? Settings on top of settings. Here we go. All right. Uh, so we've got 45 minutes. Let's do it. Oh, before we do the last 45 minutes, at the end of this, we're going to watch a movie. Oh, no, I mean, I'm going to watch a movie. You don't have to watch it. But if you do want to watch it, I posted a thing today about um, a, a link to it. And you've got to sign up to SBS, but it's a free movie. This is a, one of my favorite movies. It's such a, well, I don't know, oh, so many movies are my favorite movies. This is such a beautiful movie. I can remember so well the first time I saw it. Actually, oh, have, you're nodding, Lisa. Have you seen this movie? I, yeah, I would bet no one's seen this movie. It's such an old one. In fact, it was banned and censored for a while because uh, Winston Churchill thought it was bad for the war effort because it was made during the war. Um, but uh, it is the most... Oh, it's got Deborah Carr in it. It's, fantastic. it's just this fantastic film. And you normally just can't get it for love or money. And SBS have it and they're showing it. It's going to run out at some time. So it's a perfect time for us to watch it. Every year I've wanted to watch it. So if you do want to watch, at the end of this lecture at 7 o'clock, um, I'm going to leave Zoom on because last time we closed Zoom and it just caused all sorts of nightmares and we couldn't talk to each other. And, and then I thought we can watch it synchronized. I'll shout out on the microphone, what did he said, go. And we can all start watching it on SBS at the same time. And then there's ad breaks. And whenever there's an ad break, we can run back to Zoom and I can just chat and we can just talk and then back to the ad break. And stuff. Uh, so if anyone wants to watch it, I do recommend it. It's a beautiful film. And if you don't get to watch it with us now and chat about it now with us, then do watch it at some other time while you're in isolation. Great film. Okay, uh, let's go down here super fast. What have we got? All right, so if you want to do some projects, there's all sorts of interesting honors work you can do or summer projects or special projects. I'm really interested in deproctoring. Actually, that's now become really interesting worldwide. Um, there's all sorts of online proctoring stuff to check people aren't cheating during online exams and so on. They're all so hackable. We just damn well got to hack them uh, and we and publish it. So anyone that wants to do that as a project, working out how to hack online exams and the standard methodologies people use to run the online exams, let's do it. We, there's no problem with getting funding to do that. There's no problem with getting that published and it, you would be just... Uh, 
doing the world a, a favour because these horrible intrusive things in everyone's life weakening their security and not actually providing uh, real proctoring. Let's expose that for what it is. Uh, de-fingerprinting. Um, so how to de-fingerprint a phone because your, or your devices fingerprint you so much. So working out um, suggested things that we can do to de-fingerprint phones and then arguing, or, you know, then publishing that and having a standard on that. And then eventually Apple and various phone manufacturers follow standards like that if we can suggest sensible ones. Um, uh, uh, de-EMFing. Oh, yeah, we'll talk a bit more about EFM leakage, leakage before, but that's really interesting. De-droning is something I've been trying to do for years, and now actually companies are making lots of money out of it. I should have tried harder. But come up with ways of taking denial of drones, taking drones down. Um, and again, there's heaps of funding for that. Everyone wants to do that. Um, and, and various legal ways of doing it, and ways that residential people can do it, and, and then ways that you can do it in military context. All of this stuff's really interesting. A whole lot of IoT stuff, anything to do with cameras. Um, there's all sorts of interesting um, forensics you can do on cameras and faking stuff with cameras and all sorts of things. So anyone that's interested in anything like this, oh, oh, and one other, if you can think of a fun project even, just come to us and we'll supervise it and support it and get you all the gear you need. Another really fun one we were thinking about just recently was, um, Fooling facial recognition. So there's a lot of research going into making facial, facial recognition work. How can we make facial recognition not work? What's the minimum you've got to do to your face so that surveillance doesn't detect who you are? I do little experiments with that whenever I go through passport. I think I've told you customs control. I do it when I get my photos taken for licenses. Apparently eyebrows, people pay a lot of attention to eyebrows. So shaving your eyebrows off, that's why Peter Dutton is ahead of the game, I think. Um, just doing funny stuff, changing your eyebrows, wearing silly glasses that have false eyebrows on them is one way, maybe, but then people will adapt to that. It's probably whack them off. But anyone that wants to work on that problem of how normal people can fool facial recognition, that'd be a fun project. Or any other fun projects you can think of, please speak to your tutor first if you think it's awesome, and then get in touch with us, mail me, Lisa or Lachlan, and uh, we'll line you up with some fun work to do. Uh, in the news, there's all sorts of interesting stuff happening in the news right now. Um, which country was it? Hungary? The president gave himself superpowers, and I'm pretty sure if I read the news right, there's no extent, there's no time limit on it. Remember we were talking about that, the powers of a dictator are important in times of a crisis. Most important thing to put in place, you can give people absolute power, sure, but it's got to have a time limit on it. It's just 101 for governance. He's given himself superpowers, but forgotten to put a time limit on it. So that's the end of Hungary. They're already in a bad way already before that. Uh, lots of other interesting things happening about invasions of privacy. I think we talked about it um, on Monday. Given a crisis, people throw everything to the wind. They just focus on one thing. So at the moment, if you say coronavirus, you get anything through. So all sorts of legislation is going through. I mentioned some legislation that went through on Wednesday in New South Wales Parliament. Um, that's actually been retracted since that because it was a bit flawed, but a new version of that came out on Friday. I should give you a link to that. That's a little bit frightening. Um, so there's just all this privacy stuff going through super quick now. And around the world, if you look at news media, people are saying, let's just track all our citizens. Let's just do this. Let's just do that and because it'll help us with corona and it probably will so there you go game over we'll do it um no one's talking about oversight no one's talking about controls no one's talking about limits no one's talking about time limits on it and of course once a day is correct it's good. so this is just a we're seeing a live example now of how people get very focused on solving one problem that's good for a long time no one was focusing on the virus and that was except the poor people in china and so it's good at least they're focusing but they've switched from zero percent to 100 percent, and really we want them to be a nice sensible 80 percent uh, there's some fun jewel heists going on. Well, actually, they're tragedies and people that do it are dicks. But um, there's some interesting ones that show interesting security weaknesses. And I think I might have posted one on security everywhere, someone that just stole it with a fishing line through a window because they left something on display in the shop and there was a gap between the top and bottom of the doors. There's some RSA news from 2015 or so that was interesting. Uh, some stuff on misdirection. We did the two-carb Monty. Find the lady, the, the, the three-carb Monty within the white the speaker. Uh, this is a book I really like. Um, it's by a magician where he talks about misdirection. I really like this. I think I got it electronically, and then I think I actually got a real copy of the book too. That's quite hard to get. He's done a trilogy of books. Um, that's really interesting. And if we get a chance, I will talk a bit more about misdirection in the future. Um, here's the um, Kevin Mitnick picture. If you've ever seen him speak now, he's a guy in a suit. It's very, very wealthy. But here's him when he was a, well, was he a teenager? When was he born? 1963. We all know Kevin Mitnick's date of birth. Well, there you go. Oh, he's born in a different time in California. That's interesting. Um, so uh, that's uh, the arresting for Kevin Mitnick or the wanted poster for Kevin Mitnick. Wanted. <laughs> and then the hack of um, by, I can never pronounce his name, but Shimamura. Um, and here's Shimamura. Uh, and I still haven't talked about that hack. I keep promising it. And we'll do it. No, we won't have time today. But we will do it before the end of the course, I promise. So whew, lightning tour through the notes. But now there's some things I want to tell you that sort of 
finishing off a few bits and pieces we've already done with symmetric ciphers. That's the old sort of, let's just do something jumbly and chaotic and do it a lot and hope people can't undo it type. Um, so first of all, there's two different sorts of ciphers. There's stream ciphers and block ciphers. And I haven't really talked about that before. So a stream cipher, you get letters one at a time and you encrypt them one at a time. So you could imagine you could put that on a telegraph line and as people are transmitting the message letters one at a time, did it, did it, did it, did it. In real time, you could did it, did it, did it, put out the um, cipher text. And if you saw that, I did a really funny message in my scope. Um, uh, that's a stream cipher. A block cipher is you accumulate quite a lot of plain text and then when it's filled the bucket of whatever size you want, then you convert that whole bucket into a whole enciphered bucket. So, and then, oh, I sort of wish, you know, if we were ever going to record part of a lecture and play it back, you could just record that and play it back and say, we should sack this guy, he's gone mad, and then just have me going, did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. <laughs> out of context, it's very funny. And again, that was a funny message in Morse code. So we filled the bucket up with plain text, nothing's gone out yet. And now that we've got enough plain text, we go, and now we put out the, the cipher text, so that we make a cipher text bucket and put that all out. So it fills up a bucket and sends it out. But now what's the advantages and different disadvantages of blocks and um, streams? Well, you can probably imagine that if you're really just relying on jumbling things up and making things confused, then doing it on a whole block at a time seems a bit easier. Like you can transpose and move things around inside the block. Whereas if you do it on a stream, then you know that this character in the plain text corresponds to this character in the cipher text. There's just less stuff going on. So you've got to make sure what you're doing to go from plain text to cipher text characters is very, very difficult to undo. So block text, block ones tend to be, they just seem to be, um, they, I don't know, most of them are, I don't know, I don't really know any good stream ciphers, I guess. All the famous ciphers are block ciphers. We can talk about some stream ciphers later on that have weaknesses. Um, here's how a stream cipher could work, by the way. A one-time pad. A one-time pad is like a stream cipher. So if you had a genuine stream of random numbers and then you've got a stream of plain text and you just XORed them together. Have we talked about XORing before? Does everyone know about XORing? Everyone, if, you, if, you're not, if you're new to computing, I know some people here are, look up XORing. Just look up what it means to XOR one number with another number. XORing is quite beautiful, but it just takes one number and takes a pair of numbers and puts them together to make another number, um, just like plus or times do. So you can have a table, just like you have a times table, you could have an XOR table. Um, so the nice thing about XORing is if you do it twice, it undoes it. So if I had a stream, a stream of random numbers and a stream of plain text numbers, and I just XORed the corresponding ones going across, that would give me a stream of ciphertext. And then if I XORed it again with the same stream of random numbers, it would give me the corresponding plain text back. So, um, Richard, yeah. there's a comment in the chat about letting some people back into the video stream. Should we? What, let's take a vote. It's, it's not looking good. All right, how do we do it? Does anyone know? I'm um, just the messenger. Hey, Richard, I'm keeping an eye on it. So oh. I can't see anyone there at the moment. I've been letting them in. You've been letting them in as they come in? Yeah. All right, thank you. Sorry, not very democratic. I just made a decision to do it. No, that's good. No, that's good. Just let them in. Let them in, let them in, let them in, let them in. Um, uh, so welcome. Sorry if you got stuck in the waiting room for a while. I'm not... I will try and fix it up so that it doesn't happen again next time. It must be, it'd be my mistake. I'll set a dumb setting somewhere. Um, uh, so stream ciphers, yeah, that would be a perfect cipher. That'd be great if you could have a genuine stream of random numbers. And the, the problem is the other person at the other end also needs to have the same stream of random numbers. How are you going to share two streams of genuinely random numbers? You can't. The whole randomness of it is that they can't both generate them because they're random. You'd have to generate them in advance and share them like a one-time pad. And then that doesn't really scale, does it? It's, and then there's no clear way of doing that from a key. So how most people do it, a stream cipher, or one way of doing a stream cipher is this. You have something called a pseudo-random number generator. So it's not really a random number generator, it's a pseudo-random. uses algorithmic methods, but the numbers it produce look random. No one can work out if they're random or not. They look random. Um, and then 
you have one that starts with a key. The key sets it going. And different keys give different sequences of random numbers, but different keys give the, the same keys give the same sequence of random numbers. So we agree on a key in advance. Uh, and lots of webs, lots of the stuff on Wi-Fi uses this. So we agree on a key in advance, the receiver and the transmitter, and then we both start trans computing our streams of pseudo-random numbers, and I XOR the message going out with them, and you XOR the message coming back in with them, and so on, that's all done. But block ciphers are the most common ones. So DES, RSA, all that sort of stuff, block cipher. So um, just talking about block ciphers, if you think about it, suppose you've got a block size of, I don't know, um, 500 bits, say, then you've got to break your message into 500-bit chunks, and then you encipher each 500-bit chunk of plain text to get 500-bit chunk of ciphertext, and then you join all those 500-bit chunks of ciphertext together to get your whole ciphertext, and at the other end, you break the chunks of ciphertext into buckets of 512 bits big, and then you decrypt each bucket, and then you put all those together, and that gives you the plain text. So it's basically a matter of bucketing and unbucketing. So there's two challenges here. One is, all right, I've got a ciphertext method of working on a bucket, but how do, I, how do I encrypt a whole message that's got multiple buckets? Do I just join all those bits together or should I do something more complicated? That, the, that is called the mode of the cipher. So what mode should I use on the cipher? What block mode? Actually, it's called the block mode of the cipher. What block mode should I use? The naive one of just encrypt every block separately and concatenate them together, stick them all together. That's code electronic code book mode, ECB mode. Um, but it turns out that's quite weak um, for a range of reasons. So you should probably look up, actually. That's what, what, What's the problem with ECB mode? So people do more elaborate modes, and I'll show you the modes in a second. But the other problem that we get with blocks is that it's very rare your message is exactly 512, or however long it is, bucket size, bits long. So there's often a little bit left at the end. What do you do? Well, what we normally do is we pad that out to make it the right length, pad it out with rubbish or something to make it the right length, so it fits in a bucket. And then at the other end, when they decode the whole thing, they work out that that's padding and they throw it away. So how do we pad it out? And how do they work out that it's padding? Turns out that's really delicate. And if you get that wrong, you can crack the whole message. And the, um, there's the, the famous way of doing that is called a padding oracle attack. And I'd love you to read about padding oracle attacks and see if you can work out how they work. They are so beautiful. Um, so that's just an example of you think you've got a good cryptographic method, but the way you implement it isn't right. And remember what I told you about implementing cryptographic methods. What have we said? Don't roll don't your, do own. It. Don't roll your own. Don't do it. Don't ever do it. Just don't do it. If anyone ever walks up to you and says, oh, we're going to use RSA. I'll write my own version of it. Just you should keep a big kipper in a box and just hit them over the head with the kipper. Or ask them to implement a bug bounty program. <laughs> That's what I say. But first, I have a bridge to sell you. Um, yeah, so yeah, absolutely, just don't do it. That's right. Or a bug bounty program so you can profit from it. I mean, Mickey, you, you have a devious mind. I think you have a security mind. You, I, I'm saying don't do things, and you're saying, no, no, let's not say not do things. Let's work out where the advantages is if they do do that. People are going to be people. If you attack them at every step, they'll never listen to you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So help them out, but help yourself at the same time. You know, that, it started sounding like Gandhi and it ended sounding like Machiavelli. It was a very nice transition over that piece of advice. Um, so here are the different modes. Electronic code book mode. You can see here, if you look at the picture, I hope everyone can see it. Can you see it? Oliver, can you see it? Lisa? Yeah, yeah, you can. Thank you. Um, so you can see each block of plain text gets enciphered, and then they all get stuck together at the end. And the same key is used for all the buckets. That's ECB mode. And that's how, you, and then below, how you decrypt. Cipher block chaining. Now that's, that's a very interesting mode. On this one here, you you start with something called an initialization vector, and that's public, everyone knows it, or we always call them IVs. It's the thing that starts the ball rolling. So there's an IV and you XOR the plain text with it. So you jumble up the plain text before you start. Then you do what you do normally, you encrypt that whole bucket and you get the cipher text. And then, as well as putting that cipher text in the output, you take a copy of it and you use that as the initialization vector for the next block. You XOR that with the plain text and blah, 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 blah. That means a change to any one block has a ripple through the whole message. So if you get one little bit wrong, the whole message is different. 
So you can't crack it block by block. The whole message sort of ties together in dependencies. By increasing coupling, amusingly, you make it harder for the attacker because it's more brittle. And here's how you decrypt. You should look at that and make sure it makes sense, but it's actually quite simple. My favorite mode is this one though. It's called counter mode. And using counter mode, you don't actually encrypt the message. You encrypt counters. So you start with a counter. Uh, that's a, uh, a counter is a series of numbers that you only ever use once. And a number that you only ever use once, we do that in cryptography so often we give them a special name. Does anyone know what that's called? A nonce. Nonce. It stands for number once. So a number you only use once is a nonce. And the easiest nonce to use is just start with zero and go zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. So let's say that's what we do. But it doesn't really matter how you do it here. So you've got the counter and you encrypt the counter using the key. Then you get that answer and you XOR it with the plain text and that gives you the ciphertext. And then you get the second number in the counter and you encrypt that. Uh, with, you encrypt that with the key and then you XOR that with the plain text and that gives you the ciphertext and so on and so on and so on. Can everyone see? It looks weird because you're not encrypting the text, you're encrypting the key, uh, you're encrypting the counter each time. So you're almost generating one-time pads. You are, perfect. I was hoping someone would notice that. It's a one-time pad for blocks and the ra sequence of random numbers you're getting are generated by encrypting a, a sequence of counting numbers because if your encryption really does a good encryption algorithm, if you change the input even slightly, the output should be randomly different. That's actually awesome. It is truly awesome. It is so clever. And the other really nice thing about this, this is why it's my favorite mode. Though I don't know why people don't like it. People don't use it. I think sometimes it's a bit counterintuitive. Maybe people are suspicious. Of it. So Christian mentioned this along with RSA a few weeks ago, and I started looking into them. And what I really like about counter mode is one, you can encrypt and decrypt in parallel yeah. because of the counters. Yeah. And two, it's meant to be more secure than RSA. You can encrypt more bits than RSA without weakening the cipher. Yes. Sorry, uh, cipher blockchain. You can you can leverage yeah you can leverage it up. It lets you it lets you leverage what you're doing. So the expensive thing, which is running RSA, um, you you only would have to do. Um, Oh, sorry, no, I didn't understand. Maybe say that in a comment offline so I can work out exactly what you mean. But yeah, normally you would try and do this to... So what I meant was there's a limit to how much information you can encrypt with a given key before there's enough entropy out there to reverse the key. Yeah. And counter mode has a higher entropy than cipher blockchaining. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. That's right. Um, but the first point you raised is the one that always blows me away, which is... The other modes, so for example, if we look at cipher blockchaining, you can't, notice you can't do the second one. Oh, you can do the second one. Oh no, sorry, the encryption. You can't do the second one until after you've done the first one. Can you see that? Because if I use my mouse, the plain text is here. You have to encrypt it. And then after you've encrypted it, you use that as initialization for the next one. And after you encrypt that, use that as initialization vector for the next one and so on. So there's this dependency between all the blocks and you have to do one, then the next, then the next, then the next. But down here, there's no dependency between the blocks. So you can do them in parallel. Very nice. And if the blocks arrive out of order, it's not a problem. If you lose a block, it's not a problem. Very, very nice. Um, okay. Padding Oracle's homework is to find them. And how are we going for time? Oh, look at all that time we've got. We've got so much time. Have I been speaking really quickly? I bet I have. Um, so I'm just going to take a breather for one second and ask you guys if you want to say something or ask something, and then I'll show you the end of the lesson. Is there anyone that wants to say or ask anything? Thanks to everyone who sent the photos, by the way. That's fantastic. It's so good. If I wasn't completely stressed out by losing the recording and have to record it again, I'd have stripped off the metadata and posted it already. Anyone that hasn't sent a photo, if you just send me a photo of you just smiling or deforming your face like some people have done, it really, really cheers me up. And when I eventually get the metadata stripped out, I'll post them for everyone to see. Um, so yeah, please just grab your phone and take a random photo of you doing something random in isolation. Uh, and I promised I'd do it, didn't I? I haven't done it yet. I will do that too. Um, I'll write that down. Um, so any question at all? And no one has any question about anything? I can't believe no one has any question about it. I have a question about um, the privacy that we were talking about yeah. last lecture. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know. I guess it's a personal preference, but it can kind of seem like you go to the whole point where you upturn your life, you make everything so difficult for you to achieve. Yeah. Like, how do you find how do you find a nice balance? What balance should you aim for? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the million dollar question. Really, that question you've asked could be applied to anything in security, and that's when you graduate. I hope what you're always going to do this this mm. zero or 100 percent is no way of living your life it's crazy because you don't have infinite resources so if you go 100 on some things you're forcing yourself to go zero on others it's a type one type two sort of trade-off but in a different context um the shape of that trade-off but yeah um so yeah lauren spot on the real question as a security person is we can never get perfection so how do we spend our resources to get optimum perfection and it depends on what things are worth to you like what your particular profile is what some things might be more important to you than to other people and other things less and so on but the the sort of thing that economics tells us is you should put as much effort into everything so everything gives you an equal return essentially so if there's something that's a massive problem put as much effort into it until you've reduced it the concern it's holding down to this level but if you now you've lowered this lower than some other thing you're concerned about and put effort into that thing to bring it down and just do it simultaneously on all the things. Um, don't just take one all the way down. That's stupid. Because again, weakest link, life will kick you with the, the thing you didn't pull down. So for privacy, my thought is uh, it's very hard for individuals to maintain privacy. I just do it as a sort of uh, a fun intellectual exercise to see how it's possible. But the whole world's conspiring against me. So 23 and me. Some people send in their DNA to be tested, just like the FBI fingerprinting. And of course, that company keeps the data and sells it on and links it to other data and data brokers sell it. And now it's tied to your name and date of birth and address and things. So you can try. You can just say, well, I'm not going to use 23andMe. Good advice. Um, but if your family does it, you, you're caught. You cannot use Facebook. I don't use Facebook. But if people put me in photos and tag me, and presumably, I don't know, oh, can you only tag people with people in Facebook? Maybe if I don't have a Facebook account at all, I'm sorry. You won't get ta a tag linked to your profile, but they can still put your name in it. Yeah. yeah. Which will come up in many Google searches. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've got crazy relatives that fill in ancestry trees. you got, you know, people just leak your data for you. So you cannot reach perfection. You've just got to work out the best you can do. I really don't quote me on it, but I think Facebook keeps shadow profiles as well, which means you've actually got a Facebook profile, whether you've signed up or not. Um, I've heard that too. And then, yeah, when, when you do sign up, inevitably, um, <clears throat> they'll, they'll attach all of the data that they've kept in shadow to that profile. Oh, thank you. I downloaded my Facebook profile for the activity and I noticed that they, there was evidence for people having shadow profiles from my phone contacts, which is uh -huh. like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. In other words, people that aren't on Facebook were still... What, can you, did you post that? Can I find see what you did? That sounds really interesting. Um, I just made a quick comment on it on um, one of the homework activities. I can download my Facebook data again, but they had like a list of um, people I knew, and some of them were people who didn't have Facebook accounts who I just had in my phone from like five years ago as contacts who now. Yeah are in Facebook and presumably have a shadow profile if they know their name and could attach whatever else to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, so going back to Lauren's question, so we can't kill ourselves. You've just got to survive and you know do the best we can. I hope, because you guys are smart and you're the next generation and you're going to go out there and you're going to be professionals and some of you will be senior. And I know that because it's happened with students I've been teaching. They're out now in really senior roles making decisions. So the way to affect this at a personal level is not much we can do. But as you become influential and go out there, you can be a sensible voice. There needs to be a sensible voice in the conversation. I hope some of you become politicians because politicians really don't understand this at all. I hope some of you become CEOs of companies and put, make the companies do the right things. You know, I just think the way of, this needs, I said before, the thing with privacy is uh, there are these different actors Oh, I can't believe I said it. What's a better word? Entities. Entities. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. But there's different entities. So the government really wants to get your data and do things with it for good purposes. And the business really wants to get your data and do good things with it for good purposes. Making money. And individuals don't mind giving up their data. So that 
as an individual, I, uh, as an in, which way is individual? As an individual, you you, you don't um, have a lot of power in that whole thing. But maybe as we go out, so I think we need to attack this problem at the level of governments and at corporations. Um, so yeah, I think we need to agitate to bring that change. So so you just have to pick your battles and work out the right ones. But I think being informed, you've just got to be informed. Uh, you can't be a democracy and not be an informed citizen. And then you guys are cleverer than me. Maybe you'll think of ways of doing it. But yeah, you can get worried about it so much and do nothing, and then that's hopeless. You know, I, I mean, at least we're not alive 200 years ago when we could just get polio or smallpox or or even more years ago where the Lord of the Manor could just come and take us and kill us or make us a slave. You know, you know, there's lots of bad things in life. Uh, you know, in the scheme of things, this isn't as bad as that, but life could be better if that we weren't in a surveillance state um, because it is leading in a scary direction. So we should try and make it better, but I don't think we should get depressed. Lauren, you suddenly look a bit darker. Is every, is, are we seeing your emotional state in the environment around you? Oh, uh, yeah, um, that's definitely it. It's not a sunset at all. <laughs> it looks so nice. I'm very, <laughs> very jealous. Okay. Um, yeah. So they were great questions. Is there one one more? I'm sure we've got time for one more before I um, show you the next thing. I'm just moving the laptop lid down so I can see you all. Someone asked a question in chat about whether or not we've discussed the final exam and if we know what's happening with that. I don't know if we have. Do you want me to discuss it again? If we have, or for the first time, if we haven't, well, let me. Just... Um, well, I remember there was a discussion before that you were going to do a take home exam, but has anything changed? No, take home four hour exam. Um, uh, that's because we're writing it to be a three hour exam. And I'm thinking four hours, so you've got more time and you can be more relaxed. And if you've got technical problems, you don't get all stressed. Um, mm -hmm. Aim to get it finished in three. Um, uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll send you the exam. We're likely going to trust you. Uh, we might do one or two really banal security measures that I'll tell you about just about a week in advance. So it won't be open book? Oh yeah, it's open book. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's an open book exam. But is that just with access to the shared um, notes that we've been taking, or is that everything everywhere? No, no, I think it has to be access to everything everywhere because um, because everyone's only human. If I said to you, do this exam, but promise to me you won't go on the internet, it's a hard thing to ask anyone. And if you did it, you'd feel disappointed in yourself, but you know, you might do it. It's hard. What if it's really important to pass this course? What if it affects your visa or something, you know? Then I'm sort of putting in the way of moral hazard, encouraging you to do something bad. It's, I think it's unconscionable to do that. And then if you didn't do it, then you might be all the time jealous and thinking, oh, it's not fair. Everyone else is cheating and I'm not cheating. So I think just, I don't want to put you in that way. And the other thing is I could lock down your computer and do all sorts of paternalistic controls on it. And I just don't think that's the right relationship. Yeah, there are some of those proctoring services people have been um, mm -hmm telling everyone about on Facebook that I'm very much not a fan of. No, that's right. That's exactly right. I think it's the wrong relationship for a teacher to have with their students. Essentially, it's one of distrust. It's be like me saying to my children, I don't know, uh, we don't lock the alcohol up. Maybe we shouldn't, but we don't. Because So regarding the benign proctoring you're considering, what's that for? Oh, it's just something to just make it slightly harder to do some sort of cheating okay just to remove some temptation from you no, cheating is a strong word i just i'm really just for your interest I'm, I'm just trying to set it up so at the end of it everyone feels yeah that was probably okay yeah that was probably okay. so um yeah that's how we're gonna try and do it and just you know you know how i think about marks anyway in this course i just want you to come out of this course being better and i hope the course has helped you and you've learned some stuff and you've changed because who cares about marks? You know, who talks about the HSC anymore? It's so ridiculous. When you leave uni, no one's going to care about these silly marks we talk about all the time now. Uh, what matters is how awesome you are. When you go for your first job interview, no one's going to say, oh, what were your marks? They're going to say, tell us about you. What's something awesome you've done? What can you do? And if you've done awesome things and can do awesome things, as your portfolio will show, then they'll hire you. And if you cheated and got high marks, maybe they'll hire you for a little bit, but, you know, you'll be found out almost straight away. So... You know, I just think uni's here to help you become awesome. And it'd be like, I don't know, it'd be like trying to stop people cheating at the gym. Someone writing on their gym workout sheet, ah, oh, I pushed 10 kilograms up 
but really they only pushed eight. So we could have some sort of surveillance cameras around to check that when you write down how many kilograms you pushed up, it was a real number that you actually pushed up. But who cares? Because the only person that looks at that little sheet is you to track your progress and make yourself awesome. Or. So um, awesome or is actually a word. I'll copy that, copy right now. So yeah, that's how we're going to do the exam. So I'm hoping the exam will be fun. If I've done it right, you come out of the exam going, woohoo, that was really interesting. Wow, I'm really proud. And look at all the stuff I knew. I thought we just talked all the time and didn't learn anything. And now I can do all this stuff that I couldn't have done at the beginning of the course. Now, I want to tell you a little puzzle. We've got um, 13 minutes left. If you've got more things you want to chat about, then hang around and watch the movie and chat at the end or during the ads. Or just message me or send me a... I'm very happy to talk to anyone at any time or respond to emails or, or on open learning. I try and go through checking all the comments on open learning. So, yeah, write me messages there. And if you want me to email me, write a message there saying what your email address is. I'll go. Um, oh yeah, Andrew. I uh, just on another quick question about the exam. How did you do that, be... by the way? How did you raise your hand? That was so impressive. Oh, uh, there's like a there's a button that says raise hand, and then I think it gets your attention. It did. It was fantastic. Oh uh, yeah. So just another question about the exam. Would yeah. it be live online, or is it one where we get given? an assessment paper, we write our answers in some document and submit it by the time. Oh, I see what you're asking. That should be over. Um, so two parts to that. One is obviously the second one for me is much better than the first one because I can just think of all the things that could go wrong with the second one. You know, your internet goes down or some stupid coding error we've made or something. You know, I just sort of, at a time of stress, I want everything to work. So as much as possible, it's going to be the first one that I give you something. You can be offline or online or whatever, and you can just work on it. Write it in a word processor of your choice or whatever. But at the end, probably just submit a PDF or a text file. Probably actually just a text file. Okay. But part two, there are a couple of practical things if you're doing six, eight, four, one. Now, we're going to try to do much of the practice. We normally have a very practical exam and we're not going to be, and we could have been more practical this year because we're teaching more practical stuff finally, but um, that's going to hold us up. So um, Lachlan's fooling around with a couple of different versions, but there might be, you have to go online and attack a website or do something like that. But there might be some for that practical component where you have to be online if you're doing 684. Yeah, but I guess if it's something like getting a flag then still the answers could be done in a separate document and submitted, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you'll just submit some document, but you might need to be online to go and do something. Yeah. yeah. It depends whether they give you the binary or they just host it somewhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. This is all the stuff that we're falling around with. There's obviously advantages and disadvantages to both. We want it to be bulletproof, simple, and keep you guys happy. That's our object. Right. Um, yeah, so anyone else, that if anyone has urgent, I know exams sometimes are stressful, so raise your hand if you have another question about it. There was a question before about the uh, job application thing and confirming that that will be published, like the expectations or the criteria for that will be published shortly. Thank you, Oliver. And that's Lachlan is probably grinning like an idiot as we're talking now because for about, I wrote something three weeks ago and I keep saying, oh, God, I better post that today. And then every day some st stupid thing comes up and I don't post it. So bad marks to me for time management. Um, uh, I think that's probably more important than getting Monday's lecture up. What do you reckon? Maybe I'll do that first thing tomorrow and then I'll record the replacement lecture second. How does that sound? Yes? Yeah. All right. Sounds great. Um, oh, and the last thing about the replacement lecture. Do you want me to actually just run another lecture and the ones that missed it could turn in? And this time I'll make recording work. So even if you don't watch it, you can still see a recording. Because uh, if you did, I thought we could do it at 9 tomorrow. I have a little gap between 9 and 10. I'll do a super fast lecture. What do people think of that? Would people be interested in zooming in at 9 o'clock? Would anyone want to do that that hasn't caught the lecture? Which lecture is this for? The one on Monday. You were there, Lauren, but the recording didn't work. So people that weren't there didn't get to see it. Is that 9 a.m. tomorrow? Yeah, 9 a.m. tomorrow. Yeah, I know it's depressing. But I've got a gap then. No, that's a good idea, I think. Would you, would you come, Jazz, if I did it then? Uh, possibly, yeah. I mean, I, I was there on Monday, but I wouldn't mind joining again. Oh, you're very same, nice. Same with me. Yeah. Okay. All right. I will. I will do that. I will. Let's do something at nine tomorrow morning, and then, I, then we'll get a recording of it. It might just be. 
Um, but anyone else is very welcome to come. The more people, the better. Oh, well, now I'm looking at the time. We've only got eight minutes. Um, but I think we can do it. So we want... Uh, and, uh, sorry, would you have the recording of this new one? Like... Today? Tomorrow. No, tomorrow, 9 a.m. one. Yeah, yeah, that's the because idea. I won't be able to... Will you be recording that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, so, okay. Yes. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Um, the whole reason I'm doing it is to get a recording, but I just think it's more fun to do it if we're actually talking to each other. I, yeah, yeah, sure, uh, because I won't be able to attend that tomorrow. No, 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 you don't have to attend it. I'm doing it to produce a recording. Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. And if that doesn't record, then, or if tonight's lecture, <laughs> I, I don't even know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to cry. Yeah. Maybe we should <laughs> all record right. the lecture. Yeah, you should definitely all record everything. Yeah, yeah. Never trust me. Things go wrong all the time. Record, record, record. That's a great idea. Uh, okay. Now, we've got a little bit of time. I'm just going to do what's on the screen now. So we've got this puzzle. CVEs, Essential 8, OWASP, and more. Okay, let's do CVEs. Oh, actually, I could just make that something for you to find out about. Look up CVEs. CVEs are a standard way of numbering vulnerabilities that people find. So you know there's bugs, vulnerabilities, and exploits. Bugs are mistakes in software. Vulnerabilities are bugs that potentially weaken the security of the system. And an exploit is something that makes use of that vulnerability to weaken the system. So when a security researcher is looking through code, they're hunting for all the bugs and trying to see if any of them are vulnerabilities. And if they find them, they report them and they get given a number and that is fame. So if you ever get, and they give, the numbers are called CVEs. So if you ever get a CVE, I think we give people automatic extra marks. Is Lachlan, are you here? Or Chris? I'm here. We give people extra marks if they get a CVE, don't they? Yeah, I'm not sure if we put that in the outline this year, but we, we do. Yeah, yeah. Did we put in the outline that if you do something awesome and get in the Hall of Fame, you get an extra mark or two? I'm not sure. Extra marks, but I don't think you've put what counts. Anything that blows us away, and a CVE blows us away, so you'd get like... Definitely. Yeah, you get an extra two marks or something if you find a CVE. But the main thing is you'd go on our list of people that have found CVEs, that's the famous list of famous people. Shame there's no marks. Shame there's no Oh, well, there still can be marks. There's still marks in my head. I'm still going to say who came first. I'm still going to, you know, uh, uh, oh, if you go on to do 6447, we'll still look at the marks you get in this course to work out eligibility for 6447. And I'll still write you a letter if you ever need one. I'm saying, bloody hell, Oliver got... 99 in this course so you can't see it because of the stupid virus on the transcript um and you know i thoroughly support anyone hiring him he's amazing you know so i'll i'll, I'll still use that number whenever i can to help you um the recommendation from you is probably worth more than a 99. yeah i think recommendations from people and, <laughs> and, and when we look at recommendations we always look at how you went and we speak to your tutor and marks are one of the things we look at not the only thing of course because you could be awesome and get low marks you got distracted by something really interesting or had a bad run or whatever um, but you know it's a part of the evidence we see so yeah it is a pity there's no marks but i don't know maybe i'm trying to be positive and think maybe it'll be good maybe we'll learn some stuff from this you know you can't you can just get upset about that like lauren was saying before you, you just got to pick the the battles you got to pick what you get upset about there's some things that are too big and you can't change and probably won't make much difference and then there's other things where your efforts make a big difference and it's just you know, it's part of being wise and it's working out which is which and it's so hard to do when it's in your face and it's affecting your emotions. But yeah, anyway, I don't think uh, it's something I'm gonna, I just think in the scheme of things, it's not the end of the world. Um, all right, the essential eight. So sometimes people write lists of mistakes that other people make because we see, and this is a lesson from history, people just always make the same mistakes over and over again. And I guess if you're a penetration tester or an auditor, it must be so annoying to see firm after firm after firm making the same mistakes. So various organizations have made lists of saying, hey guys, here's 10 things you should fix up at least to be a bit more secure. Or here's a list of the most common vulnerabilities we've found, types of vulnerabilities we've found this year. Compare it with last year's list, it's the same ordering. Um, so people put them all together. So look up the essential eight. That's a bare minimum of what organizations should do. Um, uh, it's the top eight of a list that's much, much longer. Look at o the OWASP. Um, just look at these things. They're just lists of obvious things that people should do um, and they'd be worth knowing. And look up some CVEs because they're so interesting. Go to the CVE database, click on a few and find out what the vulnerabilities were. There's so much fun. Um, okay, 
But now we've only got three minutes and the best bit, I had so much time and I've blown it all. But I reckon we can do it in three minutes by speaking quick. It's the Stargate ghost problem. This is a, a problem that occurred to me about the same time I was first teaching this course. So I often try and put it in the course because I'm very fond of it. And the, and the problem is this. There's a TV show called Stargate. I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a science fiction show. I never really watched it, so I don't know much about it. I, there's a guy in it who's very confident and he speaks in an American accent. And it's just my bias, I know, but if someone's really confident and speaks in an American accent, I find them a little bit abrasive. So I call him the abrasive man. But actually, I suspect he's the hero of the show and he's not really abrasive. And I've seen lots of episodes. I'd really love him and everything's fine. So, so don't take this personally if you are abrasive man or related to him. But let's just call him abrasive man. So there's abrasive man. And abrasive man goes through this thing on the library lawn. You know that big circle we've got on the library lawn? Well, if you go through that, you go to another dimension. And he went through that and went to another dimension. And every episode, they'd go through that and go to another dimension and then come back through it into Earth. And the military owned this ring thing in this universe, in this TV show, the military run UNSW. And um, they would send people through the ring thing and it's called a Stargate for some reason. I don't know why. So in this particular episode, he goes through the Stargate goes to another universe he meets creatures in this other universe i can't even really remember the details of this episode i can only remember my retellings of it he comes back to our universe and the person that's traveling and a person travels back from the other universe with him but the weird thing is no one can see him anymore but everyone can see the person that came back with him so he comes back through the, the stargate and he's talking to everyone and everyone's going, where's he gone? Where is he? Where's he gone? Why have you come back? And the alien says, yes, I've traveled from the other thing with the abrasive man. And the abrasive man is here, but he's been shifted th through 90 degrees of the fourth dimension. And you can't see him anymore, but I can. And the crazy man's saying, tell him I'm here. Tell him I'm here. And the crazy man and the alien says, he's here. He's here. Now, this is a military base. And they're trying to work out if this planet's good or bad or if they should blow it up. Or so There's various decisions to be made. And there's a major that runs a military base that wants to ask this guy, abrasive man, what happened on this planet, if it's dangerous, if we need to worry about it, if we need to blow it up, whatever. But he can't talk to him. He can only talk to the alien. And the alien has to relay messages from the major to the invisible man. Actually, I think the invisible man can hear the alien, can hear the major but the major can't hear the invisible man. So it's only one way thing. So the major can talk to the uh, abrasive man, but abrasive man has to talk to alien and alien has to talk to the major. And of course the alien has a vested interest here. He doesn't necessarily want his world to be blown up and he could be sinister. Maybe he rotated him through 90 degrees through the fourth dimension as part of what. So anyway, here's the challenge. I was just wondering about it later. I can't even remember what the episode was about, but this thing started to bug me. I started thinking if I was a crazy, if I was the abrasive man or if I was the general, what protocols would I use here? How would I be able to talk about the things we needed to talk about when literally I have an untrusted medium? How could I do that? And so that I call the Stargate ghost problem because it's a bit like a ghost. So I'd like you to think about the Stargate ghost problem. See if you can think of ways of solving it. And I've been thinking about it for years. And every now and then I think of new ways and new ideas which have strengths and weaknesses. And I'm sure you'll come up with other ones that are better than mine. And sometimes I find weaknesses to ways that I previously thought were good. So just think about the Stargate ghost problem. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes, it's an interesting problem. Okay, um, I've gone one minute over. I think that's not too bad. What do you reckon? Thank you for your patience while I went and did that ABC thing. Um, thank you, Chris, for announcing your um, lecture on Friday, is that right? People can... Thursday, so Thursday at 6 p.m. So if you want to do some wireless hacking, then that's where you gotta go. Thursday, 6 p.m., go to Chris's Tute. It's on the table and we'll make an announcement on open learning on Thursday morning too, saying where it is. But sure. it'll be on the Tute table, shouldn't it? For your tute. Yes. And we'll post a video of that later. So everyone doing 6841, even if you can't turn up to Chris's class and watch it, go and watch the lecture, that's the extent. And Lachlan, how we got, we had an extension lecture from a few weeks ago that we were going to record. Do we ever do that? Have I just not noticed that or is that still in progress? I'm not sure what you're talking about, sorry. The week uh, five extension lecture, I don't think. There was no extension lecture from week five. Oh, perfect. <laughs> Problem solved. Luckily, you're a legend. Okay, uh, so I hope some of you are going to stay around and watch the movie. Um, uh, to everyone that's not, 
goodbye. It's lovely seeing you all again and hearing the crickets and all that sort of stuff and the aeroplanes and the dogs barking. And I wish you all the best. I hope you have lots of fun in the course. If I can help you with anything, message me. Keep sharing the songs because I'm enjoying them. Keep sharing your tips because they're inspiring. Send me photos if you can because it makes me very happy every time I get one. And uh, I'll see you on Monday, unless I see you at 9 a.m. tomorrow, if you're coming to the catch-up lecture. And for those that are hanging around for the lecture, for the movie, the best movie ever, make sure you log into SBS now, create an account, only takes a few seconds, and search for Blimp, and you'll find the movie. And just get it stopped at zero, 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 and in about five minutes, I'll shout out, go, and we can all go. So I'm gonna go around and get my one set up on the other machine. Uh, keep listening to this if you can. Maybe even you could zoom in on your mobile phone if you wanted to watch it on your laptop. And to everyone else, goodbye. See you. Bye, Richard. See you. Oh, Thanks, Richard. Bye. Thank you, everyone. See you, Richard. See you. I've got my one set up. I'll give you a few more minutes to do yours. It's sbs.com.au. Uh, uh, or Google SBS on demand, probably. It's a little, it's buried inside the SBS site. SBS on demand, completely free. Woohoo! Thank you, SBS. Uh, and we'll start. Start at 7.10. So if you need to go and get some food or something, go and do that. I might go and get some popcorn or something. And we'll come back and at 7.10, we'll press the go button.